What's my experience in the beef industry? Truly limited, to be honest, but I spent three days uh, on a farm or a ranch in Alberta in 1995. Uh, I, I emigrated to Canada in no, 1975. Uh, <laughs> dear Lord, in 1973, I emigrated to Canada. In 1975, I spent three days in Clare's home, Alberta, or near Clare's home, Alberta, on the Burton family ranch, and uh, uh, that taught me that the price of beef was too low. It's hard work. There we go. So off we go. Uh, first, I thought I'd sort of set off and try to put meat and beef in context and then get into the sort of stuff you'd like me to talk about. So here we go. You've got to start with some statistics. I have some economics in me. Uh, so looking uh, at the Rabobank stuff from uh, last year. I mean, if you're in the meat industry globally, you've got to take some pleasure from this that if you reflect back on what's happened in meat demand over the last 30, 40 years and what's expected to happen over the next 20, it looks pretty good to me. Uh, of the major proteins, uh, and beef has the, the lesser of, the, uh, of growth. And you might notice that actually the rate of growth is declining, but it's still well into double-digit figures. So, you know, come on, three cheers for the meat industry, great stuff. But what I notice, if you look at world consumption of meat, then actually it's terrifically influenced by what happens in China. So here we are, 430 million tons of meat is consumed each year, or last year anyway. Uh, but if you take out China, that's, you take out a massive 120 million tons. What's the point of this? That whatever happens in China in terms of demand has a disproportional effect on what happens to the overall market for meat globally. Actually, it's not just meat. If the Chinese elect to eat anything, let's say, let's say they take an extra kilo of anything, of cabbage, for goodness sake, then that means that we've got to find 1.3 million tons of that extra stuff to be consumed in China. So they have a huge influence. We've seen that in the dairy industry, how they can be very positive in terms of driving demand globally, and then what happens when they take their foot off the pedal. But the other point about this is, Look where beef is in the great scheme of things. That, uh, from my estimate, is that uh, are we a big meat player? Well, yes, important, beef, of course. But actually, beef and certainly lamb are minority meats. You're in the minority meat business. But the good news is you're in premium meats. And as I wander around the world and look at the price of beef in retail stores, then typically it's at least twice the next protein down, if you will, which might be pork. So we're premium meats and we're minority meats. I think we should celebrate that. Okay, and then an old slide for me, but just to remind us that if I look forward over the next, oh, what, 15 years, what do I expect to see in the global meat market? I think the bare-knuckled, eye-gouging, ear-pulling, slugging fight is going to be between industrially produced fish and industrially produced chicken. Why so? Because look at their relative competitiveness in terms of uh, not least feed conversion ratios. So they're the two big needs. And in emerging countries where incomes are still relatively low but increasing, as they change their diets, and we can see that happening right in front of us, the meats they move towards are often chicken and fish because they're more affordable. What's the message from a beef point of view? Actually, we want to keep a long way away from that fight because if we get involved in that fight, we'll get our clocks cleaned. You know, if you look at tilapia, if you look at bassa or catfish and the feed conversion ratio there, I mean, it's close to one to one. Look at uh, good poultry operations, they might be 1.5, 1.6 to one. Uh, incredibly efficient. Keep well away from that fight, I would suggest. And so it's, as I said, it's the tilapias, it's the basses of this world. Uh, as a Brit, uh, I'm a co-national, uh, then I know around the world, if you have fish and chips, increasingly it's more likely to be bassa and chips or tilapia and chips. And there are some countries, I was just working the other day in uh, pork and poultry in Malaysia, and I love this. Here we are, fish bratwurst. It just shows you, you know, the, the importance of fish and the overall... Uh, meat demand pattern in, in Malaysia. Germans would be just, you know, well, you can imagine what they <laughs> Dear Lord, here we go. 
Okay, so if you look at the, you know, the overall picture is uh, globally meat demand increasing and uh, albeit at a slowing rate, but still pretty fast. But actually, it's a differential picture, isn't it? Because if you go to developed countries, so-called developed countries, higher income countries, in many cases, demand for meat overall is static, if not declining. And so I tend to call it peak meat. Uh, why, if you look in the UK, principal reasons for meat reduction, where well, we see meat just the per capita basis just sliding down, concern about health, through a difficult period economically, saving money, and clearly animal, getting near you now, animal welfare concerns, environmental concerns and food safety concerns, and who are more particularly likely to reduce meat consumption, you can see it here, women and older consumers, that's me. Uh, you know, I'm eating less meat, why? Uh, because I'm just getting older. Uh, you know, just, if you think about it, what happens, just for those over, what happens when you turn 60? How does your, your diet change? Come on now, get into it. You've just been hogging it through breakfast. Well, you, eat, you tend to eat less. You need less. What do you eat less of? Well, I'm suggesting meat. Uh, why might you do that? Will you allow me to do this? I do it at most of my talks. What happens when you're 60? When, when you're 60, and like me, if you're standing on a stage and you look out, if you look right out there, if you look out, you can, you, you, you can see the end. <laughs> you say, dear Lord, there's the end. You, you know, I, I don't want the end. I want to be healthy, I want to live longer, so there's an unseemly rush to change the diet. Suddenly fruit and vegetables come, we try to actually fix the problems that we've created for ourselves over the last 40 years. And in, in countries which have an aging demography, North America, uh, certainly in Europe, you can see people cutting back on meat. Portion size gets less, and that has an impact on our industry, I would suggest. Actually, in the U.S., if I look at the USDA figures that uh, just out, you can see on, the, on your left-hand side here that actually over the 10-year period 2006 to 2015, in terms of a per capita basis, you can see the, the pretty drastic decline in consumption for beef in particular. Now, the expectation is between two, over the next 10 years, actually, that that will reverse and it will increase. And I'm not convinced of that, frankly. I mean, the USDA are pretty good at what they do, ERS, but uh, this seems to be sort of supply-driven. They're saying, look, production is going to increase, and therefore consumption will increase. Well, if production increases, it isn't necessarily consumed at home. It may well be consumed away from home, so, which is fine for the industry. But so what am I saying? We're at peak meat in many cases, and particularly for red meat. And we shouldn't panic about that either. So, okay, this is for the oldies. Because I think that something has changed in terms of consumers' perception. What was Clara saying back in 1984? Where's the beef? Where's the beef? Hang on. There we are. Where's the beef? There she is. And I think meat, and particularly beef, is in a different place now relative to where it was in the 80s and the 90s from a consumer and a shopper point of view. Uh, remember, I came to Canada in 1973. Uh, I was a Dominion shopper. Do you remember Dominion, that rather irritating jingle that they had? Uh, and it was, it's mainly because of the meat. In the 70s and 80s, Dominion was a, the leading uh, retailer, certainly in eastern Canada, not necessarily in western Canada. And it was mainly because of the meat. Actually, it was mainly because of the beef. And then if I went, uh, let's go forward a decade into the 90s, into the U.S., what was the jingle there? Beef. It's what's for dinner. And that was considered to be very, very effective. Beef, it's what's for dinner. And I look at that now and think, isn't it sort of wonderfully dated? Isn't it? Now, if you say, what's for dinner? People are much more likely to say Chinese. Or pasta. Or uh, it's a takeaway. Or it's Italian. And actually, particularly if you said to uh, millennials, you know, that's a rather awkward group between about 20 and 32. I mean, I think their question would be not, what's for dinner? They'd say, what's dinner? I and mean, they're much, much more likely to have mini meals, to have a series of snacks. That that's sort of 
three meals a day, nutritionists hate it, is starting to break down. And people don't say, what are we having for dinner on Wednesday night? Beef. No, we don't say that. We've changed our view, I think. Uh, so, and I can see this sort of, if I look around the world, it's a, we're in an interesting industry where a large part of the world is actively out there trying to reduce our consumption. I mean, I think we just should acknowledge that, not necessarily embrace it, but come to terms with it. Uh, here we are with some Eating for Tomorrow, which is survey work out of China. So I'm now moving to an emerging country, albeit a fast emerging country. Uh, and what do we say here? Why people are willing to eat less beef and or lamb. This is survey work done very recently in, in uh, China. Concern about health. And I think, you know, we've got to acknowledge that, whether we like it or not, that there are those who are concerned about meat consumption and its impact on health. Climate change. And we'll be talking about that over this week, I'm sure. Animal welfare. Uh, I'm trying to reduce food costs, etc. On the other hand, why do people refuse to eat less beef? Uh, bad nutrition, that doesn't mean meat is bad nutrition, it's exactly the opposite. It's saying if you, if you don't have meat, that's bad nutrition. Uh, I'm a meat lover, we, you know, we're carnivorous, or at least we're omnivorous. So here we are in China where there is an active program, government back, to get Chinese consumers to eat less meat for a variety of reasons, part environmental and in part health. And also, if I look around, we can see some competitors coming out of the woodwork that were just not there. Uh, you'll be well familiar with this. I know if you take Impossible Foods, uh, backed by the well-heeled investors, you can see there, uh, with the Impossible Cheeseburger, which is being trialed right now. This one is actually now on sale, Beyond Meat, the Beyond Burger. And in my entire professional lifetime, this is the first time that I've seen beef or meat analogues that actually will stand a chance in the marketplace, that are good, that are, are pretty tasty. Uh, in my own country in the UK, let's go to the Corp, which is you know, just a, a supermarket chain. Here's corn, and I'm sure you know corn. It's widely available in Canada, the US, right across Europe. It's a mycoprotein. It's like a, a, a fungal. It's like, you grow it like a mushroom, if you will, on oil. Uh, and it is a chicken substitute, if you will. And here we are with breaded mini fillets, corn, chicken, uh, or corn roast, chicken pieces. That's cheeky, isn't it, to call it chicken? But why I've put that up is when I was in the co-op shopping, uh, at the end of my shop, so they might get me to be more loyal and to come back again, I get a coupon, as you would do in supermarkets in North America, and it was two pound off my next purchase of meat or poultry or corn. And so corn is sold in the same case as the meat. And from a consumer point of view, it's the same thing. So we're starting to see, if you will, uh, new competitors. And I think we've got to keep our eyes on it. Uh, and then, for example, you know, the world meat-free uh, days of this world. So there's, this, there's activity around our industry to reduce consumption. Uh, what's forcing that? In, in part, I, I think those who are most active are environmentalists, but also it has a health basis as well. And from my own perspective, I look what's happening in the UK. Here we are, eating better for a fair, green, healthy future. This is a consortium, if you will, a broad alliance in the UK. Uh, and eating better is a broad alliance to demonstrate that shifting diets to more plant-based eating with less and better meat is better for health, better for the environment, better for animal welfare, etc., etc. Now, why I put this up, is look at the organizations that are backing this. I mean, there are a lot of them. And they are very, very influential. The ones that stand out for me, whenever you see the panda, then you know it means business. WWF I mean, is a heavy hitter. I would suggest Oxfam, too. In my own country, RSPB, which is the Royal Society for Protection of Birds, which sounds sort of really fancy, but actually it is the most effective non-government organization in the UK. It has more members than all the political parties put together. We like birds in the UK. And they're very influential. Moving on. So there's so much of this around. It's, it's, uh, again, I'm not taking a, a view on this. I'm just sort of reporting what I see. Here we are, uh, the very influential Chatham House report of last year, Changing Climate, Changing Diets. And it seems to me that in, it, at government levels and at very senior levels elsewhere, the conventional wisdom is that meat consumption is good for the environment. 
No, you may not take that view. So scientific opinion is increasingly identifying meat, particularly beef, lamb, and goat, as being detrimental for human health and for the environment. Uh, few consumers indicate this is good news. Few consumers indicate they will reduce consumption for environmental reasons. More indicate they will reduce the meat consumption for health reasons. But here we are. This is what the changing climate document says. The overall message is quite clear. Globally, we should eat less meat. Global per capita meat consumption is already above healthy levels, critically so in developed countries. We cannot avoid dangerous climate change unless consumption trends chase. That's the conventional wisdom. And there's a relentless deluge of information and misinformation relating to meat production and its environmental impact. I mean, you know, th this one, for, here we are, National Geographic, which is sort of well perceived. And how often do we see this figure? You know, 1,800 gallons of fresh water go into one pound of beef. And it becomes the accepted fact. Uh, so what am I saying? That the, meat, the beef industry is right bang in the center of the bullseye. There we go. Uh, not everywhere, of course. Uh, here I was in Saskatoon earlier this, this year where I was uh, just delighted to see in the real Canadian superstore. I mean, that would have sat just as well in the Dominion store of the 1970s and 80s. Increasingly, you wouldn't see that in Europe. That's unlikely. Okay, so what's happening out in, uh, to the demography of our developed country markets? Just have a quick look here. Because the world is changing, the, the, the world of consumers are changing. And as I mentioned back to millennials about, uh, you know, that three meals a day and how things are, are changing. Percent of meals eaten by, in the UK, this is single diners. So what this says is 40% of all meals, of all meals consumed each year in the UK are consumed by one person, sitting, eating, or standing, eating alone. And two diners, just two people together, 36%. So that means that 80% of all meals consumed are eaten by two or one per person. So what? Is that just sort of interesting cocktail conversation? Is it something you can tell your neighbor? Or how does that affect the industry in which we work? I think it has a profound impact on the industry in which we work. One, it tends to mean that we eat out more. It also means that people purchase not so much uh, beef but they want, it, they'll buy a, they want to buy a meal or a meal component. Cooking has become uh, purchasing components and then <laughs> bolting them together. Gone are the days. I mean, I'll use an old-fashioned word now, which is, almost sounds Victorian, that we used to go shopping for. Not all of you will remember it. It's, we used to go shopping for ingredients. Long gone. Long gone. Meal components, bang. Let's put them together. Uh, what will we pay more for? Well, for health, a little bit more. For better taste, yes, but actually people want the meal solution. Don't sell me a problem. Give me a solution. It's four o'clock. The children are hungry. I need a meal solution, not a meal problem. Beef is a meal problem, I would suggest. And as I look around the, the markets of the world here, I was in uh, Holland the other day. Here's Albert Heijn, which is our hold internationally. Uh, they're selling eggs by the seven. So that's one a day for 30% plus of, 30% uh, of all households in Holland will be one person. And that's their, uh, their egg requirement for the week. Uh, here we are, I do a lot of work in fish. The one person portion pack, uh, just, we just, we're just used to seeing that. That portion size in uh, North America would be unacceptable. For your pet, it would be unacceptable. <laughs> Let alone, here we go. And so increasingly, as I say, we don't go to buy beef. You know, what's, for, what's Wednesday dinner? Beef. No, we're looking for meal solutions. So here we are. I go to Marks and Spencer's. I'm in a household of two, me and my wife, when I'm home. And how does Marks and Spencer's sell the protein component of the meal? They'll say, okay, three meal solutions for 10 pounds. So there'll be like 10 different choices here. In this particular case, I took the steak burgers, the chicken mini fillets with some fancy sauce on, and the salmon. Uh, that works out at $2.20 per person per meal. We consider that good value. So increasingly, that's what's been offered to us. Not, if you think in history, you'd go to the meat section, and what you, you see is beef, pork, chicken. And now that has little relevance 
from many consumers' points of view. No, that's not a meal solution. Uh, or, and we see also this sort of food retail and food service converging. Uh, businesses used to have a food retail component division and a food service component. But now I think they're essentially the same thing. So I'm back at Marks and Spencer's here just the other day as it happened. Uh, what would I buy there? It was the chicken, a carrot and swede crush. It's fresh, just to be microwaved. A bottle of red wine and a New York vanilla cheesecake for two. And that comes in at 13 bucks. That's just ripping share of stomach from food service. So you can see food retail and food service converging. Uh, and how, uh, again, I think it's great news for us in the, uh, in, in the food industry overall that there are increasingly different routes to the consumer. So here we are. We could be in Toronto, Vancouver, uh, Manhattan, New York, uh, uh, London. And we all know about Uber. And here's Uber Eats. And what's Uber Eats? It's where six famous restaurants in a certain area will publish menus for the week. They've got a link with Uber. You use your Uber account. You can order what dinner or lunch you want. It's delivered within 15 to 20 minutes, and it's reasonable value. In this particular case, it was a brisket sandwich with burnt end baked beans, and it comes in at $12.75. $12 I mean, Manhattan, that's what you tip the doorman. Is that good value? It's terrific value. And again, so increasingly, more, there's more roots to the consumer. Here we are with delivering ingredients which you then cook. So this is an Australian, New Zealand, actually it's a New Zealand company, but it's doing very well in Australia called My Food Bag, where you receive a box full of ingredients which will give you five different dishes for five days of the week for four people, let's say. So these are for busy people who like cooking but just don't have the time to prepare. Increasingly, that's influential. Uh, and where do I see, again, serious competition for, for, for beef? I think we really have to sort of keep looking outside livestock and meats. Uh, I do a lot of work in the salmon industry, and I think they're really serious competitor for beef in premium global meal and snack markets. Look at the success of sushi around the world. Every country I go to, it's a snack or it's a meal, and it's just right in our heartland of premium snacks and premium meals. Okay, so quickly into the stuff that you're more interested in. Increasing complexity driving food purchasing behavior. In history, it was about price, taste, convenience, but now it's much more about health and wellness, about the experience. I want stories around the food that I consume, and it's its social impact. So where was it produced? Are you looking after the local economy? Uh, is it local? What's its provenance? What are the heritage aspects? Animal welfare, w worker welfare, etc. So it's about value and it's about values. And don't underestimate that. That's just, it's not just a developed country thing. I see this every country I go to. Many, many emerging countries, as you can see, the increasingly the middle class, much more interest in values. Um, and I'm just interested the other day, so some Danish research saying eco label the market for eco-labels to grow by 66% over the next five, 10 years or whatever, and that it will become much more powerful than the regulation. It's not about the regulation, it's about the label, which is the problem. So, the title of my uh, talk was something, How Do You Like Your Beef? So, here we go. How do you like your beef? With adjectives, please. I want my beef with adjectives. My view is that beef is the noun. And I just don't think there's enough margin in nouns. I think the margin is in the adjectives. And what are those adjectives? I mean, that's the real challenge, I think, is to work out which adjectives the consumers and shoppers value and are willing to pay more for. Is it free range, grass fed, free from, Aberdeen Angus, rare breed, remember I'm from Wales, or oh, I didn't say I'm from Wales, Welsh Black, uh, Aspen Ridge, Neiman Ranch, Cape Grim for the Australians, uh, Wagyu, organic, omega-3 rich beef, or uh, dry-aged, bird-friendly beef. Come back to that in a minute. The margin is in the adjectives, I would suggest. And sometimes, here we are on provenance in, uh, in Europe, or it was for the UK until we, rather peculiarly we exited to Brexit, uh, that we had, if, you, if you're Welsh as I am, that uh, Welsh lamb and Welsh beef was protected by EU regulation. 
in two or three years' time it won't be. But will people pay more for Welsh? Actually, they will pay a little more for Welsh. Here we are, back to Wales. And my particular favourite, it's out of your protein, but look, how many adjectives can you find for this chicken meat? And what does it take to sell chicken for 23 bucks a kilo? Okay, let's count the adjectives. First of all, it's British, one. Free range, two. Pembrokeshire, that's a county in Wales, three. Corn fed, four. Reared by the scale family, five. Uh, in a national park, six. Uh, Corn-based diet, seven. They're free to roam and forage on clover, eight. Wildflowers and herbs, we'll pop that in, nine. That delivers you $23 per kg. There's a margin in those adjectives, I can assure you. But it's working out which ones are they willing to pay for, which ones do they value. Uh, again, from beef, I'm always in just feel happy when I see fresh beef being branded uh, with particularly good stories. The one at the top is uh, Kate Grimm, uh, which is it's a brilliant piece of branding. Uh, I see Kate Grimm beef in Hong Kong, in Singapore, uh, in better restaurants in, in Australia. Uh, bottom left, Great Southern, which is JBS in, uh, in, in Australia, but also it's exported. And there, the link is with the farmer. And then taking a Canadian example, here's Cargill with its sterling silver. The margin is in the adjectives. Royal beef. That's uh, sort of current for Canada. You've just had the royals here. So Donald Russell's has got the, uh, the royal warrant up on the right hand, uh, left hand side. Yeah. And here we are back to, uh, I was in South America last week. And here we are with bird and biodiversity friendly beef from the Pampas of South America. It's in the adjectives. Uh, here's an Australian example, but for chicken. Did real farmers produce the meat product? Yes, they did, and there's a little story about them. Uh, and is this only high-income countries? Not at all. Consumers want adjectives in their meat in Thailand, for example, where I do lots of work. They want health-conscious pork. They want free-range and herb-fed pork. They want happy pork. Uh, well, you know, happy most of the way through its life. It's an unfortunate. And just coming here, I was in uh, Heathrow yesterday, and here's coffee with adjectives. Uh, it's fair trade, it's organic, and it's world land trust. So consumers want them, and also there's another. Thing, they want that. They also want their meat free. Consumers want their meat free, and they want adjectives added, and not additives added. I would suggest they want it antibiotic free, hormone free, additive free, salmon other free, cola, GMO free, free range. And the one down the bottom I just learned last week, deforestation-free. And there's a bewildering barrage of logos and claims. And I'm sure we can talk more about that this, this week. It's really asking a lot of the consumers to make any sense of what's out there. And there are so many, so many. They want their meat free. This is such a big deal, you know it. From, again, from the UK, here's uh, sausages with free adjectives. Gluten-free, wheat-free, dairy-free. Uh, something like 30% of consumers in uh, the U.S. actively seek to reduce gluten consumption. When we know full well that 2%, uh, only 2% are unfortunate enough to have celiac disease. If we look at the issues surrounding antibiotics, uh, when The Economist, which is my sort of comic of choice on a Saturday, when, it's, uh, when they elect just recently to have on their front page, when the drugs don't work, the rise of antibiotic resistance. You can see that great push out there for, for our industry and all of agribusiness to just back off from antibiotics. And the pressure that McDee's, McDonald's has been under and indeed Yum with KFC, etc. It's sort of huge. And again, it's right across the world, back to Singapore and Malaysia, uh, in the New Strait Times when I was there a few, few weeks ago. We're treating antibiotics like sweets, etc. And it's that sort of traceability and transparency in the system which becomes so important. Uh, and again, right around the world, here we are in South Korea with a quick response code so you can, in the store, go to the TV monitor and just scan the code and trace the meat back to the farm and follow the meat story, if you will. But I think the, the, the really good news here is that I see right across the world there's increasing interest in the farmer. Who produced it? Was it a real farmer? We want to know. Tell us more about that. 
I was in New Zealand, I'm, I'm not very green myself, but I was in New Zealand recently talking with Zespri, who are the major exporters of uh, kiwi fruit from New, from New Zealand, talking with a sales and marketing director who was just whimsically telling me that he'd just been on a sales visit to the US and he'd taken a kiwi fruit farmer. And he was a little bit peevish. He said, you know, funny thing is, nobody wanted to talk to me. They just wanted to talk to the farmer. And farmers have become fashionable. I mean, you might not think you would, but you have. People want to know more about you and what they do. I think that's brilliant, frankly. So, what's so slightly worrisome is if I look at the pressure on price, uh, whenever I see these $1 menus, I have all the trust in the world, and I do, in McDonald's and the big players. But uh, when I see sort of smaller players with $1 menus, and they say the eggs are free range, the beef grass fed, antibiotic and hormone free, no HFC, etc., all natural ingredients, and the check is a dollar. I think, wow, hang on. And what I do know is that whenever you get price premiums reflecting the adjectives I've been talking about, you'll get food fraud. Big deal. And here we are with Warren Buffett, and he just says it all. The brands of retailers, food service, and restaurants are reliant on all suppliers sharing the same level of integrity as the person whose brand and reputation is at stake. That's you guys who are holding the, if you will, the food integrity torch on behalf of McDonald's and major, major players. It takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. Just think of Tesco and the so-called Horsegate scandal of two or three years ago. We're going to see more food fraud. Again, back to this sort of annoying, don't they get under your skin, this constant nagging. Here we've got the Union of Concerned Scientists. Cattle cleared forests and climate change, scoring global companies on their deforestation, free beef commitments and practices. So why do we have to be more environmentally sustainably conscious? Because consumers want us to be. Special interest groups are just, just driven by it. And we are measured. So here we are with uh, this group, going back, sorry, the Union of Concerned Scientists, now scoring major players on their deforestation uh, track record, if you will. Uh, moving on, let me just quickly. Here's behind the brands. Uh, here's Oxfam measuring major manufacturers on their policies with regard to land, women, farmers, workers, climate, transparency, water, etc. Here, palm oil. It's not just meat. Here's WWF, you know, the damn panda again, just scoring uh, palm oil buyers uh, on, you know, by. Are, are they being responsible? And then here we are with an app, the Bicot app, where you pick your issue as a consumer. Is it animal welfare? Is it, uh, what have I got here, um, immigration? Is it um, LGBT rights, etc.? Uh, and you just pop that into your phone, and then as you go through the supermarket, again, you just bang on the, on the code, and it gives you a rundown of how they perform. There's a lot of pressure here, and it puts pressure on our industry. And you can see how the major players are having to respond. I would suggest that the Unilevers and the Nestles of this world are world leaders in terms of this way beyond corporate social responsibility, moving towards this notion of shared value, if you will, and sustainability, very similar to that which we've heard first thing this morning about economic, social, environmental coming together. So, will consumers pay for sustainably sourced food? Uh, well, let's what it say here. Foods labeled as sustainably sourced, US consumers regularly buy. Look, it's not a majority, far from it, 10%. Uh, there's increasing interest in food labeled as natural, but I think that's lost its meaning, as everything seems to be so natural. What do people think about the way their food is farmed and produced? That's really positive from an industry point of view, I think. And people want to know, what are the ingredients on processed foods? Tell me what the ingredients are. So the survey suggests, and here we got one here, people are split on whether they would pay more for food and beverage products that are produced sustainably. I mean, the better part of 40% say, yes, they would. But 30% said, no, they wouldn't. If you want my opinion, it, the survey suggests some will, but increasingly, they just expect it. They expect it. They expect it to be sustainable, environmentally. They may not understand what sustainable is, but they expect it to be sustainable. 
So who's more likely to pay, if I look at consumers? Actually, again, the surveys say college more educated, or at least those who have been to college, that doesn't necessarily mean more educated. Higher income, uh, lower BMI, that's interesting, lower b b body mass index. And actually, I think that's got an income link again. Uh, those in better health, and then work done by the University of Alberta, actually by uh, Professor Goddard, um, I mean, some very good work, survey work in Canada, that people, you know, again, we don't have to be rational about this, that will be concerned about sustainability more if it's a special meal, or if guests are coming. And it's just a reminder to me that, for example, look, I'm passionate about the environment and sustainability. Absolutely passionate. Um, at the weekend. <laughs> you know, I know I should be on Wednesday, but I haven't got time on, on Wednesday. Uh, get on with it, Brenda. You know, you've got ballet in 15 minutes. Girl, uh, no, I don't know where it comes from. Just eat it, for God's sake. So here we go. I've got to, it just times up, it's told me. Some concluding comments. Look, the long-term global demand outlook for me, I mean, for my mind, it looks really strong. But it sure as hell is going to be volatile. And I come back to, look what's happened to dairy. You'd expect to see strong growth over time, but it's never going to be a straight line up. There's going to be ups and down, and I think not least contingent on economic growth performance in China. I'm suggesting to you guys, watch out. There's some strong competitors about in fish, in meat analogs, and not least beef analogs. And the whole area of plant protein is just increasing in terms of consumer interest. Beef is a minority, but it's a premium meat. Celebrate this and distance yourself from cheap fish and chicken. And look, for one reason or another, red meat consumption, it is in the firing line in developed markets anyway. But the great news is that you know, I can see it with myself and my own purchase behavior. I'm going to eat less meat. I'm going to eat less beef. But when I do, I want better, and I'm willing to pay for more. So I'll eat less and pay more, and that's a great opportunity for us. And then finally, look, the green bar, the sustainability bar, is moving up inexorably. And increasingly, and looking to the future, consumers won't pay more for green, I don't believe. They just expect more. So you don't get a premium for being green. But if you're not green, there's a serious discount. And it's coming to turn, it's working out how we can make money out of that. And never forget that, I think I've got one more. Here we go. I was in Australia the other day in, in Melbourne, and this bears no relationship to beef. And I st stopped to have a coffee. They're good at coffee in, in Australia. And I went into a little coffee shop, and it was a bike shop at the same time. And I was just sitting there, and there was a Cipollini RB1000 second-hand bike that was slashed in price. From $24,000 to an affordable 16 grand. And I, I said to the lady who was the sales person, I said, did, did somebody actually... She said, yeah, you wouldn't believe it. Every week we get two or three people come in and drop sixteen to $20,000 on a bike. And it just made me think, in food too, never underestimate what consumers value and they're willing to pay for. That's the opportunity I would suggest. <laughs>